All right, welcome everybody to another round of Alaska Wildlife Alliance's Virtual Wildlife Wednesday presentation. My name is Mandy Magura, and I'm the Deputy Director at Alaska Wildlife Alliance, and I'll be moderating the session today. And we're very excited. We have another one of our career spotlight presentations. <clears throat> and we'll be hearing from Dr. Kathy Burek about Wild Alaska Veterinary Pathology, Past, Present, and Future. But before we turn it over to Kathy, um, next slide please, Kathy. Um, just wanna go over some of the Zoom oh, guidelines. Sorry. Not sure why it's not going down. <laughs> Page down. Hmm, that's or, weird. While we're waiting for the slide to change, oh. I'll just go ahead, here we there go. You go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> just some of our virtual engagement guidelines. Um, as you join, you may notice that you were in uh, <laughs> already muted and your camera was off and we do that to help prevent any possible Zoom bombing. <clears throat> we do not require registration and we are family friendly events. Um, we also do that to help to preserve bandwidth. And if you're new to Zoom, we encourage you to view this presentation in full screen mode. And if you're on your computer, it's in the upper right hand corner and look for that little picture box, that picture frame symbol. That'll help you see the slides easier. Um, tonight, our speaker, she's going to go through her entire presentation, uh, but feel free to use the chat function at any time, and you can type in your questions there, and then we will go and address all the questions received through the chat function at the end of the presentation. But the most important guideline for tonight is we really hope you enjoy and learn something new. Next slide. Uh, really quick, though, I just want to introduce you to the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. Uh, we are an Alaska-based nonprofit organization, and we've been protecting Alaska's wildlife through citizen mobilization, education, and advocacy since 1978. And we are a nonprofit, we are grassroots, and so we do rely on the generous support of members and uh, supporters and wildlife lovers like everybody on the call today. And if you haven't checked out our website, it's akwildlife.org. Um, we would love to get a donation through our, web, our website. Um, another really easy way that you could support us is if you do any shopping with Amazon, instead of going to amazon.com, if you go to smile.amazon.com, you can select the Alaska Wildlife Alliance as the charity. You can shop like you normally do, um, and at no additional expense to you, Amazon will donate a half a percent of your purchase price to our organization. So that's a really easy way to help support us. Uh, we also are participating with an app called Roundup. If you are interested in that, if you make a purchase of say $9.99, it will round up your purchase price to $10 and donate that additional cent to our organization. We're also a charity with Pick and Click Give, and I believe given the early disbursement this year, today is the last year, uh, today is the last day to make any edits uh, to your Pick, Click, Give. And then a new program that we've just recently been accepted into is the Combined Federal Campaign or the CFC. And that is actually a program targeted for federal government employees or military where they can actually have an allotment taken out of their paycheck and it automatically donates to us. So if you know anyone in the military or a federal employee, um, let them know that we're now part of that. We would appreciate it. Next slide, Kathy. Uh, one way to stay up to date is make sure that you're following us on Facebook. Um, we try to use that as the fastest way to reach folks about several topics, including wildlife advocacy opportunities and updates. So this is how you can give a voice to wildlife um, and let your opinion be known. On, on public uh, events such as federal rules, state rules, local rules, things like that. We also post um, wildlife education and events on there. So our Wildlife Wednesday tonight was posted on there. Um, in the past, we've had species, pro species profiles and fact sheets so you can learn about different wildlife in Alaska. And then we also like to have a little bit of fun um, one of the posts we did recently, uh, recognizing we're all in a bit of a hunker down and under self-isolation mode, is um, try to have you identify what type of self-isolator you are based upon different behaviors and characteristics of various marine mammal species. 
Uh, we also have Trivia Tuesdays. Uh, we played Wildlife Bingo for a little while. So we do <laughs> keep it interesting. Uh, so if you haven't followed us on Facebook, we encourage you to do that. Next slide, please. And speaking of some of the advocacy opportunities, here are a couple of public comment periods that are currently open that have an impact on Alaska's wildlife. So we have one coming up. The deadline is Monday, June 29th, and the National Park Service is looking to make changes to their regulations. Um, and it's regarding a Supreme Court case that determined the Park Service could not enforce a regulation prohibiting the operation of a hovercraft on part of the Nation River that flows through the National Park Service managed Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve. So the Park Service is, is soliciting public input on those proposed regulations. And so they're looking for your comments. And you can go to our website to see how to comment on that. Next slide. A new advocacy opportunity that has recently opened up is what is commonly referred to as the Kenai Rule. And this public comment is open until August 10th. And it's where the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, under instruction from the Department of Interior, is rolling back existing wildlife protections at the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. And they plan to open up parts of the refuge to previously banned hunting practices to include trapping, baiting brown bears with items such as grease-soaked donuts and dog food, discharging firearms along the Kenai and Russian rivers, and more. So this has been a um, topic that the Alaska Wildlife Alliance has been on top of for quite a while, and we are already challenging the Kenai rule in court, and we're going to continue to do what we can to protect ecosystems and maintain healthy populations for all of Alaska's wildlife. But we need your voice. We need you to speak up and be a voice for wildlife and put in a public comment on this topic. Next slide, Kathy. And just in case you're not, not quite sure what the Kenai rule is all about, we actually have our own John Morton, who is our vice president of the board. He is gonna be giving a special Wildlife Wednesday talk next month in July. We're still working on the exact date, so stay tuned. But he'll be talking about what the Kenai rule is and what it means to the management of wildlife on the iconic Kenai Peninsula. So that's a good reason to follow us on Facebook so you can get the update on when that is coming out and then also sign up for our newsletter. Um, some other exciting Wildlife Wednesdays we have coming up. In August, we're gonna be hearing from Madison Cosma and she is gonna be talking about her research where she documented a brand new novel foraging strategy used by humpback whales uh, near a hatchery. And so that's kind of really interesting and exciting. And then in September, we have Miley Branson. Uh, she was originally our March Wildlife Wednesday speaker, but we had to cancel given um, the shutdown rules, uh, hunker down rules. So she's coming back on September and she'll be giving her talk about avian influenza and seabirds, uh, Varangia. And so we're really excited about those. So please stay tuned. And in case you've missed some of our previous virtual Wildlife Wednesdays, we do have those available on our website. Um, so you can learn about belugas in our backyard, belugas here in Cook Inlet. Uh, bears of the Alaska Peninsula, um, another career spotlight was how to be an ethical wildlife photographer. And then also, what's the difference between Canada and cackling geese? And what do we know about them in Alaska? So those are some of our existing Wildlife Wednesdays. Kathy has also agreed that we can post this one. So if for some reason, you know somebody who had to miss this one or you have to leave early, it's going to be also posted and available to you. And then one other thing that we have that might be of interest to you is we have partnered up with an independent filmmaker and she is making a documentary about the wolves in Denali. And so we have that teaser available. Um, she's called it A Good Wolf, that's her working title. So you can also go and get a little bit of a, a sneak peek about that documentary. Next slide, Kathy. And with no more ado, I wanna talk about tonight's speaker and presentation. We have Dr. Kathy Burek. She's the owner of Alaska Veterinary Pathology Services, and she has been conducting mortality investigations and health assessments in wildlife for over 20 years. She received her veterinary medicine and master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, 
She practiced small animal veterinary medicine in Alaska for two years, and then she did her residency and became a board certified in pathology at UC Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital. And so tonight she's gonna to talk to us about various cases in wildlife pathology that range from moose to marine mammals. And then she'll have some discussion of the re relevance of climate change issues. And then of course, being uh, graciously one of our career spotlight presenters, she's also gonna provide some advice on career paths and what maybe you can do to become a wildlife veterinarian. Kathy, it's over to you now, thank you. Okay, thanks Mandy. Uh, <clears throat> you covered some of my slides, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she gave the excellent introduction and uh, I was actually gonna kind of, as an idea to get on how I got into this career, uh, basically talk about what Mandy already talked about, veterinary school, that was four years, and then I actually started a master's project in wildlife disease while I was in veterinary school, and finished that up afterwards. Um, and I've always been really interested in, in wildlife, and uh, but I had kind of a practical aspect to things, and so I went into veterinary medicine originally thinking I wanted to be a zoo vet, <clears throat> but it was super competitive, very few jobs, uh, so you're unlikely to get a, a job, and there's quite a lot of um, jobs for veterinary pathologists. Anyway, I took a little break between vet school and my residency to go into clinical practice to see if I like that enough to stick with it. Uh, it was good, but I wanted to go on at that point to do veterinary pathology because in veterinary pathology, there's not many wildlife veterinary pathologists, got to tell you. There's getting to be uh, more pathologists that work at zoos, which uh, is becoming much more common. But a lot of veterinary pathologists also do uh, research and they support studies in which you have any kind of animal testing has to be read out by boarded veterinary pathologists. Um, so there, and I uh, actually came up and started my own business, Alaska Veterinary Pathology Services, because there just wasn't a job up here and I wanted to live in Alaska. <clears throat> and excuse me for coughing, I've got a little bit of a cold or something, not coronavirus. <laughs> Um, pathology, a lot of people don't know, it's a scientific study of the nature of disease, its causes, processes, development, consequences. Um, branches of my work from, through my business, I started out actually doing diagnostic work. So, you know, reading biopsies, doing necropsies on, you know, bat, dogs and cats and whatever else people, the veterinarians would call me about. And then I got a couple contracts to start doing research projects through USGS and US Fish and Wildlife Service, first implanting satellite transmitters into birds and then also doing a study on transmitted fish on the Yukon River and also got involved in some health assessments in stellar sea lions and more recently belugas, caribou and polar bear. Another part of my job is to do forensics or a CSI kind of thing for wild and domestic animals. So <clears throat> trying to figure out if there's been some kind of human interaction that's caused the mortality or illegal action for a wildlife species. Uh, people often ask who pays for me to do this? Like, how do you get to, anyone to pay for you to <laughs> do that? And it kind of depends upon the species. Uh, Fish and Game pays for uh, some of the stellar sea lion work, but is also kind of combined with National Marine Fisheries Service, small whales or National Marine Fisheries Service, as well as large whales, which are a, a bigger project. Uh, sea otters, polar bears, and walrus are US Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS, depending upon what the project is. And the other stuff is uh, fish and game. And uh, my son was also a very good helper while he was growing up. So there's he, there he is. <laughs> and then there's also private organizations that sometimes uh, enlist me to do some work listed here. And some of my famous necropsies. Sometimes I'm also called by the Alaska State Troopers. Um, if there's, you know, potentially either wildlife or, uh, you know, domestic animal issues that are having a legal consequences. So why do wildlife necropsies? Who cares? Um, well, it's interesting to determine cause of death, but that's actually a relatively minor part of it, actually. Um, management is a big deal. You know, do you find anything that uh, the management agencies can do anything to make changes or to, you know, get someone in trouble for <laughs> doing something they shouldn't do? So that's uh, the forensics. Uh, I was going to time this, but I forgot to do that. We'll just have to keep an eye on the time. And then we look at infectious diseases. Not only did it cause the death, but is also maybe making the animal ill. That's mortality and morbidity. Does it affect a, a reproduction of the animals? So affecting the population. Are there zoonotic diseases? So those are the ones that can come from animals to people. And people are much more aware of that topic these days with the coronavirus issue going on. 
And we also want to look at emerging diseases, especially in the context of climate change. It's also important for, to collect baseline data because a lot of times we don't know if something's abnormal, if we have no idea what the baseline is for infectious disease or processes or anything like that. Life history is also important for what we collect. You know, what are they eating? You know, what have they been exposed to? How old they are? Things like that. And then we archive things in museums for future studies. What kind and where do we do them? There's the diagnostic ones through the, like we get um, people that ask me to do them. They're, they're forensic ones, like I said, there's research and there's also teaching. I've taught a class a couple of years at UAA. Uh, it's a different way to get things up here in Alaska. Sometimes a helicopter, boats, or airplanes, which is awful, an awful lot of fun. <laughs> and then uh, th let's start to talk about how we approach a diagnosis to get cause of death. Uh, first, you want to uh, gather up a history of the animal. And, you know, with a domestic animal, you have the owner telling you what the history is. But with wildlife, you think about things like, has there been a, uh, a disease event? Has there been, uh, is there an unusual mortality event? Is there a, a big tide of algal blooms? Uh, is there, was there big weather? These are the things that you could have for history. Do you have a lot of animals dead? Are they all at the same level of decomposition, et cetera? And then we do what's called a gross necropsy, which is just looking at the, the, the body. Sometimes we do ancillary diagnostics, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. And rarely we get a cause of death at that point, just mostly if it's a trauma. And then from that point, we collect all kinds of samples to take it to the next step where you fix things and you can look at a histopathology, which is looking at it under a microscope, freeze things for disease agents, components like biotoxins or contaminants, and then we archive things for future work. Ancillary diagnostics we've done, uh, sometimes we use metal te detectors to see if there's a bullet, uh, radiographs to determine if there's metal in the animal. Uh, we also have done CT scans and MRIs to do um, studies on these different cetaceans when they fit into the, the units there. That's a baby killer well going into the MRI unit. <clears throat> so now I'll talk about a case so you can kind of go, we can kind of walk through it and see what we do. This is a case that was brought to me in the back of the pickup truck for a trooper. And it was a female calf. The history was that uh, it died in someone's backyard, just kind of keeled over dead. And uh, <laughs> they called Fish and Game and they gotten the troopers involved because these people were feeding the, the moose hay, which is illegal. So the purpose of mine was to determine if the animal actually died from eating hay, which is known to not be good for moose. So what do you find? This is the gross necropsy. We open them up. Uh, the rumen, I don't think I have a pointer. Do we? Oh, we do, look at that. The rumen is huge, probably from gas, but also from just being impacted with a ton of hay. This yellow line here is called serous atrophy, and that indicates the animal was fat at some point and that it lost its condition. So that indicates the animal was not getting the nutrition it should. Lungs are very wet and heavy, looking a little scary. We open up the trachea, and what we have here is foam, which is also brown, which indicates the animal had pulmonary edema or too much fluid in the lungs, as well as an aspiration of rumen contents into the lungs. This is something that can happen just terminally in an animal or it can cause the, or it can cause the death. You just, kind of, you just have to figure out what makes sense for that particular case and what you see on histopathology. The other interesting thing we saw is these little berries <clears throat> in the abomasum or the fourth component of the compartment of the stomach. That's not usual to see that in a moose. So I started thinking about it, you know, pulmonary edema, berries in the stomach, um, and uh, we decided to test it for cyanide. We didn't find much on histopathology. Uh, it looked like it had just terminally aspirated that stomach contents and these high levels of cyanide indicate that was the cause of death. Um, we initially just kind of thought, well, the rumen's impacted, it's lost a lot of condition, it, it really did die from the hay. But since we found the cyanide as being the actual cause of death, uh, we couldn't actually you know, say it was due to the, the hay. Um, one thought that we had was that the rumen impaction might have led the animal to have um, ingested unusual materials. A lot of your ornamental plants, uh, these ones listed here, are, have uh, cyanide. And when moose get into eating those things, they get in trouble. So now I'm going to uh, talk about what I call unusual mortality events, which I've been involved in quite a bit. This is primarily a marine mammal issue. And you can see, uh, here we go, in 2006 to 12, we had a cedar, sea otter one. And then we had the seal and the, the walrus one. It started in 2011. <clears throat> Never did figure out the cause of that one exactly, but uh, uh, that kind of led to the next day. Next year, we had something happening in the polar bears. 
that which was similar to what was going on with the seals. 2015 and in 2015 here we had something in sea otters and fin whales, large whales, and then we get something going on in 2018 and 2019. So it kind of seems like things are starting to happen more and more frequently with these unusual mortality events. I'm going to talk to you one about one with the polar bears because I thought it'd be fun for you guys to see live capture instead of just a bunch of dead animals. Um, these are the live capture projects I've done listed here and uh, again we're going to talk about the polar bears. Uh, this happened in the spring of 2012 and what the biologists were seeing during live captures for their studies is that they, there were some, seeing some abnormalities in the bears and so they asked me to come out and be involved and take biopsies to try to figure out what was the cause. Went up to Koktovik, hopped into a helicopter, uh, the biologist uh, knocked him down with a dart and then we went ahead and did uh, biopsies uh, of some of the, the skin which is where the lesions were. There were shortened guard hairs and the dermatitis over the neck and at the angle of the jaw, sometimes over the eyebrows. That's what that looked like. It's called alopecia, it's just hair loss. And the, some of the hairs were fractured and being lost. We had one example where there's a female that was uh, not affected, the other cub was healthy and one of the cubs was affected. But in general, what they found through uh, you know, analyzing what animals they found had this problem, versus didn't have the problem, uh, the ones that had it were actually ones that had been out of the den. So it indicates that it, a possibility for what was causing this problem was actually an exposure to the seals that were ill in the, in the time before that and continuing through 2012. We suspect there might've been a viral involvement, but I haven't actually been able to prove that. Viruses are sometimes hard to get out of our wildlife species. Um, but it was interesting that we were able to kind of pull together what the biologists knew about the polar bears and what we were seeing on, on histopathology and, and gross lesions. Now I'm going to talk about uh, sea otters and their unusual mortality events. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but sea otters have been uh, listed in the southwestern population, which is here involving the Aleutian Islands. Um, they are not listed in the south central areas or in the south southeast. So I got uh, called by USGS and US Fish and Wildlife Service to help them figure out what sea otters were dying of and we could figure if we could figure out what the causes of the decline was. We started seeing that a very large proportion of the sea otters were having a particular kind of unusual pathology and that this is the heart which is very large because it fills almost the entire chest cavity and the lungs are very wet and heavy. All these lines are fluid, extra fluid in the lungs so it's got very severe pulmonary edema. And what's causing that is that they're having these massive infections of the heart valves. This is the heart all opened up. It's very thin walled. And this is just a mass of bacteria growing on the, the valve. And since it's involving the left side, what happens is it throws off pieces of this, this um, lesion here and it ends up infarcting various structures. This is an infarcted or dead section of the heart. This is a section of the kidney that's not doing well and that, that also went to the brain. So this was caused also by a particular bacteria, it's a streptococcal organism. And we found that it's a, it tended to be a particular kind of bacteria, which is in this group of organisms. I'm not gonna go into all the details. It also would cause quite a lot of encephalitis or infection of the brain. And then we, we compared it to what was going on in California. I mean, are they seeing the same thing or not? And it turns out that they had a very low rate of this particular kind of disease in California. So they had in 60 cases a year in 2000, California, they saw one case of this kind of disease that causes the valvular endocarditis, which is the VE, and two cases of encephalitis. We're in the same amount of time. We saw 21 to 24 cases in those years, which is a 34 to 40% mortality rate due to this one thing. It's a very unusual pattern of mortality. Um, usually this kind of disease is very sporadic and usually you have a reason, like you have an infection somewhere and it, it goes into the blood and seeds the brain and the heart. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service did some abundant surveys. We were primarily getting these animals from Homer because uh, the animals out in the Southwestern population are so low and there's so few people out there, we got very few cases from out there. So most of them were from uh, the Homer area in the South Central population that really wasn't part of the, the restricted or the threatened population. So I thought, is this affecting their population? Is the decline going to continue into the South Central area? So they did an abundance survey 
And it turns out that those animals are actually increasing their population at a, an astounding rate. So they're actually doing really well <laughs> in that area. So it doesn't seem likely that that's the cause of the decline, even though we saw it in the areas in the threatened populations. So then we thought, you know, what are the risk factors? Is there a virus? We look for a virus because sometimes you get immunosuppressant suppression like you see with HIV. And we actually did detect a virus in sea otters that causes immunosuppression. Is there, is there factors of the bacteria that are characteristic? Is it clonal or is there one bacteria? And that seems to be no, because we looked in the California ones and they have similar ones there and don't see this disease as much. And looked at a couple other bacteria. No, the answers are basically no. So basically we have, we, at this point, we don't know why they get this in-depth infection so much. Um, another possibility is, it, is it a factor of uh, environmental issues, uh, changes in temperatures, such stuff like that. And that's something we're continuing to pursue. So we ended that one in 2010 because it seemed like the rates were kind of going down with what we were seeing. And then 2015 happened <clears throat> and uh, we'll be at a steady state here when we were actually looking at a lot of carcasses. There's about 40 to 60 animals per year that we collected and died. And then it was like going down. So that's why we closed the UME. And then it started coming up in 2013, 14, then it just like really exploded in 2015. And we had an amazing number of mortalities going on, primarily in South Central and with this um, sea otter mortality. Again, <clears throat> we went and looked at a lot of these sea otters in 2015, they we're seeing the same kind of stuff. There's this encephalitis or infection in the brain. And we confirmed that it was the same kind of organism. We also saw a lot of animals with the same kind of heart pathology. Um, and again, it's basically the same kind of organism. Um, we also saw some new kind of pathology where this is the gallbladder right here. And this is the tube that kind of goes out. And uh, it's actually very thickened. And in some places, this actually caused rupture of the gallbladder and infection of the abdomen with bile. So that's a very unusual form of pathology. So it's different from what we were seeing before. We also found evidence that there really was a virus involved now at this point. These are inclusion bodies in the um, gallbladder wall. And uh, that's basically just a huge package of virus. And we were able to see actual virus within these inclusion bodies. And it was consistent with the type of virus that we were looking for, uh, focine distemper type virus. And in these cases, we're actually seeing this is the lung and this is just showing extreme damage to the lung tissue and some inclusions and syncytial cells that indicate there's a viral infection. Unfortunately, we weren't able to, to isolate this virus, so we still don't have confirmation of exactly what it is and can't play around with it. We don't have the same kind of resources that they have to figure out, like with coronavirus, know within months exactly what virus you have and what the exact sequences are. So we're still struggling with that one to try to figure it out. In that year too, we were seeing domoic acid and saxitoxins. There were some pretty huge algal blooms going on all along the Pacific coast from California, you know, through Canada and into Alaska. We were detecting both of these toxins, which can cause disease in both people and animals at about a percentage of, you know, 23% of both toxins. Uh, so these animals also had toxin, but they were at very low levels of toxin. So anytime you, you're looking at a contaminant or a toxin, uh, whether it causes an effect in an animal or person is, is related to the dose. So we've done other studies with these toxins in animals throughout Alaska and found these kind of levels of toxins in even hunter killed animals up north. So the question is, was it really causing a problem in these animals, especially since we already had an absolute cause of death in them? So <clears throat> with the answer with the uh, sea otter issue is that uh, we have a multifactorial thing that causes this kind of uh, syndrome where we, we call it strep syndrome because it's the strep is causing this valvular endocarditis and meningoencephalitis or infection of the brain. We know that there might be virus in some, involved in some cases and we know that biotoxins are present and we also think there's probably a significant environmental factor because what was going on in 2015? Well, give you one hint, uh, we we're also having another unusual mortality event going on. So we had a large whale unusual mortality event. I don't know if, can you guys see this chart? Because it's hidden from me to, 
anyway, what you can see if you aren't behind that is that there's a huge increase in fin whale mortality in 2015 and also a increase in humpback whales. Can't see exactly the place that I want to show you there, but um, so the question is, do we know what the fin whales died of or the humpbacks? Well, we didn't get to a single fin whale. <laughs> it's a sample of them, so we have no idea. This is the closest I got to a fin whale. If you can see that, this is off a of Kodiak. I was getting ready to jump on a plane to go do the necropsy on this fin whale, and there it is going out to sea. <laughs> so this is just kind of a, a factor of uh, difficult being able to work with some of these things in the uh, areas that we have in such a large state. So that was the only one we could have sampled. <laughs> So it was going on in 2015, if you guys all remember, there was a, it was a very anomalous year. We had, over here, we had a, a massive El Nino event going on off the coast of California. We had, you know, California sea lands were dying at a high rate in um, California. And we also had that, and uh, it's what's called the Sun of the Blob, which is also another very warm water event off the coast of California, kind of related to the El Nino event. And then we had the blob, which was this remarkably high water, temp high temperature water going along from uh, British Columbia up through Alaska, all the way up the Bering Strait. And what we had going on that year was not only a mortality event going on in large whales and sea otters, but I'm sure you have guys heard the news during that time where we had unusual fish showing up in uh, the Gulf of Alaska. We had a huge algal bloom with toxins going both for domoic acid and saxitoxin. A very large number of fisheries were closed down because of, primarily because of the saxitoxin for both crab and um, shellfish during that year. So it was, it was a very shocking change in the environment for that year. And uh, I, I think that the large whales were probably related to the harmful algal bloom toxins. And I also think that the, the toxins and the high temperatures could affect the prevalence or of the um, disease going on in the sea otters. Either the, the high temperature allows the bacteria to overgrow or allows the virus to overgrow, but uh, there's, there had to have been some kind of relationship there. So you're probably getting the impression that uh, it's very frustrating type of work to do because a lot of times we, we get the hints of what's going on, but not exactly, you know, what's what's happening. So uh, there's always room for further further research, like more projects are going on to try to figure these kind of things out. Uh, I really think a lot of the things that, that we've seen uh, are due to changes in the climate that we're seeing. Our unusual mortality event in uh, seals and walrus, which I didn't cover very thoroughly, I believe was very much involved with uh, the changes in climate that caused an effect on the animal's ability to molt normally. Those animals had hair loss and uh, infections in the skin and also very delayed molt. Uh, seals normally molt sometime in May and June, and we were seeing animals in August and September, which hadn't molted properly and the, and the hair was causing an overgrowth of all kinds of organisms. Um, and then you get the, the, the whale event and the sea otter event, and uh, it just seems to be adding up more and more. And now currently we have another unusual mortality event in ice seals that we're, we're dealing with. And also a gray whale mortality event. The gray whale mortality event seems most likely to be due to uh, changes in the ecosystem in the Bering Strait and Chukchi Sea, which is affecting their ability to <clears throat> get enough nutrition to make it through the migrations and they're, they're in very bad nutritional shape. One thing that we're having problems with is that there's a lack of baseline data for a lot of this work and that uh, how can you prove that there's uh, an association between you know what's going on from year to year if we don't have the baselines for what was, was normally seen. So that's a problem and we're already into the events so that it, we're now even talking about a new normal, not even baseline in, in the information. We, we have no baseline or background information on the identity prevalence or how often it happens, the intensity of pathogens, and then to correlate that with uh, environmental factors. We're kind of behind the gun on trying to, to get those kind of correlations. <clears throat> That's actually, I'm done with the talk. So I got done a lot earlier than I thought I would. Um, as far as like uh, talking to people about 
getting into this kind of career, um, there's getting to be more and more more funding for this kind of work. Uh, there's going to be a lot of training programs for veterinarians who want to go into both wildlife and zoo animal work. There's going to be more availability of those kind of jobs. Um, as far as like veterinary pathology, um, it's pretty unusual still to have uh, work in wildlife and zoo animal work, but um, there's actually residencies now where you can get trained in this sort of thing. And I, like I said earlier, there's going to be more and more zoos that are utilizing pathologists to understand what's going on with their, their animals. Um, and, and that's what I have. So over to you, Mandy, for questions. We did fly through that. It was a lot of information and really appreciate you um, putting this together and joining us when you're feeling a bit under the weather. So thank you doubly. <laughs> I'm glad my throat that. lasted. <laughs> you did fantastic. Thank you. And so um, on behalf of everybody who's watching tonight, you know, we just really appreciate the time you put into making the presentation and giving it to us. So thank you. We really appreciate that. Um, on we, AWA also wants to thank all of our members and supporters. Um, you know, without your donations, we could not offer these types of educational programs, and we strive to continue that. And then just everybody who participated tonight, we want to thank you for caring enough about Alaska's wildlife to learn more. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, and we do have some questions in the chat feature. Um, I just want to ask if you guys are going to go ahead and sign off, maybe just give me a little note in the chat on where you're joining us from. We've been quite surprised. We've had folks um, internationally and as far away from India and Tokyo. So uh, we really like to know where folks That's are joining fine. us from. Yeah, it's been um, quite surprising. And a lot of uh, lower 48 folks seem to be really interested in learning about this. So, okay, so on to the questions. So is there less attention or funding for animal forensics when considering the endangered species list, and is science as rigorous? Is science as rigorous? Uh, well, personally, I think there's not enough funding for, <laughs> for this thing, but this is whatever all researchers say, right? <laughs> um, as far as like where a lot of the funding comes from, uh, there are grants that we apply for to be able to do this sort of work. Um, there does seem to be extra funding for particularly endangered animals, things like Bandy knows about a lot about the beluga. Here we have uh, critically endangered beluga whales. And there does seem to be pots of funding for that. Um, uh, again, I would say that it's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> what was the rest part of that question? Did I get it? Um, so it was, is there less attention for animal forensics when considering considering the Endangered Species Act, and then is science as rigorous? Um, I think you got that one. I think we can make our science pretty rigorous, you know, if, if you have enough funding, because for example, you know, we're looking into applying advanced uh, medical molecular technology to figure out the question of the sea otter virus. And I do hope I get funding for that. Um, you know, we're gonna apply some of the things that you're reading about in the news with, um, doing full sequencing and uh, trying to discover what the new virus is like. And, and the, there comes to be a lot of problems when you don't have a virus that's known to be able to, to weed that kind of stuff out. But, um, you know, I think, I think there is funding for that. I'm very positive. I'm very hopeful that that'll get funded. <laughs> yeah, that would be really interesting. Hope so. Um, okay, so more questions here. Um, have you seen transmission between wildlife and humans of virus and bacteria? Um, well, you know, I haven't particular, well, we have seen some of that kind of thing. Um, we have quite a few zoonotic diseases up here, including um, brucella in both uh, caribou and also cetaceans, which can affect people. Um, we have uh, seen cases of toxoplasma transmitting to people because we're finding it in surprising places. Toxoplasma gondii is a particular kind of parasite that um, insists within the muscle of different tissues, muscles of different species, quite a lot of species actually. And when people come in contact with toxoplasma when they're pregnant in particular, it can cause uh, abortion and uh, neonatal infections. And we have seen cases of that in um, 
native people up north. I think that was primarily in Canada, actually, and a couple of cases in Alaska. And I think it has to do with um, the primary host for toxoplasma are cats. Uh, so places where you have a lot of cats and you're used to dealing with cats, people take particular precautions to not get toxoplasma. But we've been finding it now all the way up in the Arctic, which is quite surprising and not what people are used to historically. So we really think that we have evidence that toxoplasma is actually moving further north and uh, is something that we're kind of trying to keep an eye on and see what's happening with that. Um, other cases, uh, some of the things that we come in contact with the dead animals <laughs> can have caused infections in people. There's um, mycoplasmas that can carried by many of the marine mammals. And it, if you don't wear gloves when you're processing them, either as a hunter or as a pathology person, can cause very serious infections that spread to the joint and systemically. In uh, <clears throat> hairs, we have a quite a um, explosion of um, Francisella going on right now, which is also something that can transmit when you're harvesting the, the hairs. And so a lot of people are just not aware of these kind of kind of things, but they are happening all the time. And of course, the classic one is rabies. You know, we have quite a lot of rabies in our state. Mm. Yep. And yeah. I, I, there's a lot of studies showing that a lot of these diseases are marching further north. And that's something that we're really interested in trying to track. Now, there's a lot of examples in, uh, especially in Europe, there's tick-borne encephalitis in uh, Scandinavia, where you can actually show that it's like marching further north as the weather the climate increases, the temperatures increase. And there's a lot of examples of that, which uh, you, can, you can find in the literature and that we're trying to start tracking. Okay, so there's been, um, I'm gonna try to consolidate. Several people have asked some COVID related questions. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Um, you know, some places have reported that some types of unusual bats do carry the Corona-19 virus. Other places have reported that open markets in China sell live animals and that they are close to the laboratory in question with the virus. Um, is there any truth to these reports? And just hold on, I'm going to lump all these together. Um, <laughs> That's surprising. Does, There's this <laughs> does the CDC have a lot of animal forensic scientists? Um, Hold on, let me scroll through here. And then has COVID-19 affected your field research yet? So that was a lot, but it's all kind of on the same topic. All coronavirus stuff, yeah. yeah. Well, it's understandable that that's what we're all thinking about a lot these days, isn't it? Well, you know, I, I think personally that um, this was, you know, this was expected to happen at some point and we should have been better prepared. It's very well known in the past and, and currently that especially coronaviruses tend to be carried in I mean, bats carry a tremendous number of coronaviruses, actually. This is not the first one from a, a bat, actually. You know, there's the Sir, SIRS virus, which occurred quite a while ago, and that was known to have originated in bats and probably had an intermediate host before it went to people. Uh, this current coronavirus probably originated in horseshoe bats in China, and they may have had an a intermediate host such as a pangolin actually, which I think would be really interesting mm -hmm. because like pangolin gets their <laughs> their revenge on people, you know, they're, they're terribly um, harvested illegally for their scales. <laughs> but um, uh, the problem with the wet markets is that people have live animals of wildlife species, including, you know, bats, pangolins, civet cats, um, you know, all kinds of things as well as domestic animals. And when you have that kind of situation where you have them in close contact, they're alive, so they're, you know, excreting, they're coughing, they're producing waste. It's a, like the perfect, perfect environment to create this kind of a situation where you have the transmission of one kind of virus to another species and then to people. So there have to be per certain steps that go on. You have the virus that's probably very well adapted to bats, and then it comes into contact with some other species, and for some reason, they pick it up. And there's certain uh, changes that can occur in the, a virus to make it more um, adapted to that particular host, because not all viruses will transmit its different species. And then what happened with this virus apparently is that uh, when it jumped to people, 
<clears throat> from whatever intermediate host there was that there was enough similarity with the receptor that we have in our lungs that caused it to really kind of get going. So that it made that critical, critical transmission of uh, a virus where it became very effective at transmitting from person to person. <clears throat> um, about the stuff about the lab being by the Wuhan market <clears throat> and whether they might have produced the virus. There's been a lot of studies being done on the sequences of this particular virus. They've done a tremendous amount of work already looking at the, the sequences of this very new virus and they can show that it's very similar to what they see in bats and that um, it just makes so much more sense that it would be, you know, through this process of jumping from bats to animals and to people versus I don't know if I don't know if we have the technology to produce a virus like that in the lab to get out and cause this kind of problem but there's basically very little evidence to show that it was a person produced one and furthermore it's been very clearly shown that a very common source almost all emerging pathogens come from wildlife species and so when you get that intersection between <clears throat> wildlife, domestic animals, and people, you're just, you're just setting yourself up for this kind of thing to happen. It's like it's already precedented that this, is, this can happen. There's no need to throw in a laboratory um, aspect to it. It just doesn't make any sense. And I think one of the questions I threw in there was, does the CDC have a lot of animal forensic scientists? Um, they have a, uh, it's actually APHIS that has a separate branch where people actually, uh, actually if I hadn't gone into, started this business, I would have been really interested in doing this, where they have a group of people that go out and, and explore um, emerging diseases. So uh, my, my research was actually in hantaviruses in Alaska. And that was before the Four Corners event. I don't know if any of you remember that, but there was a really bad <laughs> hantavirus that developed in the Four Corners areas of our Southwest. And nobody knew what it was. Um, so they had this group of kind of hotshot <laughs> pathologists, virologists that go out and they just try to figure out, you know, what's coming, where did it come from, what is it? And uh, I, I think that's very cool. But yeah, they have a whole group of people and it's an, a branch of APHIS, which is kind of uh, associated with CDC. There's also other independent labs that are very much involved in that sort of thing. I, uh, in the SEAL Unusual Mortality event, I got involved with um, researchers at Columbia University who do the more, more current, really, really up-to-date molecular analysis looking for new viruses. And they have a whole uh, we're very well funded group that kind of specializes in, in going out and looking for these new pathogens. And they're particularly, you know, they're key to that whole thing where they're looking for that intersection between wildlife species and the emerging pathogens. There's also a group at UC Davis. Um, it's, it's, a, it's called One Health when you do these kind of studies where you're looking at um, disease and health issues in animals uh, intersecting with the health and people and trying to figure out what the connections are. So there's several real big hot spots. Um, I know CDC has an aspect to that and they also have studies where people are looking into these kind of things, but um, there's several different intensive pockets of researchers doing work on things like this throughout the United States. Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, and if I was starting out now, I'd be, yeah, that'd be, that's, yeah that's what I wanted to get into. <laughs> Yeah. That'd be so cool. Boy, you could have prevented COVID-19 <laughs> if that was your job. You could have gone out and found well, it first. <laughs> I, I, but maybe you found it, but I don't know about preventing it. But, you know, and as someone else will ask, asked if it's affecting um, my work, um, yeah. there, you know, this is a human pathogen now that's in the United States. It's not, the big problem would be if, if people would transmit it to some other animal, right? So if we would spread it, spread it to a bat or something, we're not going to likely get it from the animals. We might even transmit it to our cats or our, our pet ferret, because it looks like ferrets are actually quite susceptible to coronavirus too. Um, but it's not like something where I'm lo looking at my animals that I'm analyzing, whether they have coronavirus of this particular kind of coronavirus. There's tons of different coronaviruses in animal species, but as far as this one, it's called SARS coronavirus too, actually. Um, it's now a human pathogen. So uh, there is one instance though where, you know, we're doing, 
We're working on this SEAL UME currently where we're concerned about increased mortality in ice seals. And this is a big issue because, you know, it's a very important subsistence uh, item for people in the communities. Mm -hmm. And they're very concerned that, uh, are they gonna get it from their subsistence animals? So although it doesn't make a lot of sense, because <laughs> like I said, it's a human virus, we are gonna go ahead and test uh, seals that are in contact with people, just more to give them more, you know, peace of mind mm -hmm. versus I think that it's something that seals are gonna die of. But, you know, uh, it's important to respond to uh, concerns in the native communities like that. Absolutely, especially when that's their food. Yeah, so well, I'd be more worried about people giving it to seals, but we don't know what, right. is, what happens in seals, but <laughs> right. that's not really the question. Okay, another question that came in is, uh, do state or federal governments respond to reduce the circumstances that contribute to wildlife mortality? And that is from a participant coming from San Francisco. Ah, cool. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, that, that's one frustrating thing about working in wildlife disease is a lot of times there's not much you can do about it, right? The big thing is like we're monitoring and trying to see um, if there's anything that we could do in the circumstances that might reduce chances of developing these kind of diseases. I, I think it's a very good reason to be really strong in your, your efforts to control climate change. And that I, I, think, I think that's a huge factor for what we're seeing with this increasing rate of harmful algal blooms happening and, and diseases happening at a higher rate. I really think, you know, activity to try to control climate change is like a huge, huge deal for this kind of thing. The only incident I can think of in um, wildlife disease, like infectious disease, where people are trying to act actively do something or, or in the very critically endangered wildlife species like monk seals. There's a program in monk seals in Hawaii, and I know there's other species where this is true, where the wildlife species are almost getting to be a, a form of captive population because they're mm -hmm. at such an incredibly low level. They like know all the seals. They have, they have a whole entire organization that kind of monitors their monk seals. And they've actually done a lot of projects where they're trying to figure out if they can vaccinate animals to protect them from things like this uh, PDV, like I was talking about for the sea otters. That's a very serious disease for seals. It has caused massive mortality events in mostly in uh, uh, Europe and the Atlantic coasts. We really haven't seen big events here in the Pacific, but they're just so critically endangered. They've done some studies to see if they can actually vaccinate them to protect them from it. And also working to try to vaccinate them if possible against toxoplasma. But generally I had one researcher say, well, it must, must really be a bummer to be you because you, know, you find these diseases, you can't do anything about it. <laughs> and <clears throat> I was like, well, what do you do? You, you count them and watch the numbers go down. So, <laughs> so there's that, <laughs> you know, but if we can kind of, you know, I, I really think a backline issue here is, is climate change. And you know, we need to really put some resources into educating people about it and trying to prove that it's causing a lot of these problems when we can. There's also one instance where we had sea otters that were dying in off the coast of Cordova and they were getting perforations in their stomachs because they had a nematode in there or a, a worm. And by knowing the, the pattern of how parasites are transmitted, we could figure out that these sea otters were eating fish, which they're not supposed to eat because that particular parasite had a fish as an intermediate host. So if you know that, you can say these sea otters are eating fish, which they're not adapted to. And so in that case, they're getting perforation in their stomachs. And what turned out happening is that a fish processing plant was starting to dump their fish waste close to shore, which is kind of a new practice. And so once we found these animals dying of this parasite, US Fish and Wildlife Service was able to make a, a requirement that they, they take the fish waste further offshore so it's deeper than sea otters can contact. So I mean, that, that's like one, one example, but you know, it was something that we could do something about as a management aspect of things. Yeah, that's, that's always really challenging. So that's rewarding when there is something that you oh, can yeah. do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, anytime you can kind of figure that out. Also yeah. like, you know, ship strike with large whales, they're finding that, you know, it's, it happens at a certain size ship at a, going at a certain speed. 
So, and that was found out by <clears throat> pathologists going out and, and studying which ones died of ship strike and, and going back to the records of the ships and trying to figure out how that correlates, you know, and that's something that can have a management action. Okay, we got some more questions here. So I wanna make sure we get to them. Um, these are kind of linked. So one is, can you recommend any vet pathology training programs here in Alaska or even <laughs> vet tech programs? And then do you publish and which journals? All right, well, so a training program here in Alaska, you know, there is a vet school now in Alaska. <clears throat> it's an interesting program where you have the first two years at Fairbanks and then the second years, two years at uh, Colorado State University, which is a, a really mm -hmm. primo kind of veterinary school. So that's one opportunity to go into veterinary medicine. I actually don't think there is a veterinary technician training program here in Alaska, but I'm less sure about that. Um, I think in Alaska, they don't have the requirements that you have to have official training. At least that was the way it was when I was in practice that you can do it on the job. Uh, but there's also a lot of uh, programs outside where you can get your training and come back, which I think is actually a, a way to become a better, well-educated <laughs> technician. And what was the other question part of that? Uh, do you publish? And oh, yeah. Yeah, I publish. Uh, I'm behind on my publications, of course, but um, I publish in the Journal of Wildlife Diseases and uh, the Diseases of Aquatic Organisms. And I'm trying to get one into uh, Frontiers of Science, which is kind of an offshoot of nature. That's one I'm working on to get the sea otter stuff into. Um, Marine Science Review is one of them. So, you know, it just kind of depends upon what you're looking at and uh, what fits the best with what you're trying to get out there. Great. And we're, I'm looking at the clock, we're getting close. Um, so there was one question I thought would be worth having you educate folks on. Um, yesterday, we had one of our supportive email us a photo of a dead seal that they found on the beach. <laughs> so I shared that with Kathy and the National Marine Fishery Service, and they're the ones that manage the Marine Mammal Stranding Response Program and only authorized individuals or organizations are allowed to respond. Kathy is one of those uh, individuals and organizations. So I didn't know, Kathy, do you want to talk about the value of having those reports done quickly and not um, oh, thinking yeah. it's a dead animal so I, <laughs> I don't need to call it in? Yes, oh yeah. Um, so for me to do my work and trying to figure out why something died, I need to know the fresher the animal that is, the better, the more likely my chance is to figure something out. So especially like cooking the belugas, um, it's been very frustrating because it's been very hard to get to any fresh animals and it makes our chances of figuring out what was going on much lower. So it's super important when someone finds an animal that to report it to the proper agency and there will be people that are interested in responding. Like that seal, we did a necropsy on it yesterday and, and Mandy notified me, I'm like, oh, we just, did I say we'd done it today or we we're doing it today or <laughs> did it yesterday or something? <laughs> but it's very important to know. And um, for marine mammals, you call the National Marine Fisheries Service hotline. For land mammals or even fish and birds, uh, it's Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And they have a hotline on their website also, and they do want to know. And if you find out on a Friday, we want to know. Because <laughs> that's actually when things get found, right? People are out mm -hmm. enjoying their weekend. They find something. Oh, I don't want to bother someone until Monday. No, we want to know on a Friday. And I've been almost always out on 4th of July, by the way. <laughs> because yeah. if you call on the 4th of July, we'll, we'll be there to go out, especially if it's a cook and the beluga. But um, it is not, it's not ignored when people call and report it to the right places because there's people like me, there's Kimberly Beckman, who's a veterinarian with a fish and, fish and game that'll be out there as soon as possible to respond to these things. And so um, just for those of you, if you don't know the numbers or the contact information on our website, akwildlife.com, we do have a tab on how to report distressed wildlife. Oh, excellent. And it's broken up by the type of species and who you can contact and um, also the different law enforcement, wildlife law enforcement organizations, how to reach them. So that's always an option. Um, you can always, what happened yesterday is 
we got an email through our website with a photo. And so I was able to forward that on to the proper folks and Kathy was able to get out there and necropsy it. So yep. it was great. And it was and an then, important, important case. So yeah, yeah. sorry yeah. to interrupt. So it, oh no. So it's, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> your information goes somewhere. Um, it is really helpful to get it as soon as possible. That way they can have the chance to learn more about why it died. Right. So, there is one more question. I know we're, we're out of time, so um, I just wanna make sure to get the last one. Um, there was a question about Maggie the elephant um, who was <laughs> at the Alaska Zoo and collapsed three times and she was pronounced too ill to be moved. Um, I think this is USAF moved her to California and after a year, she was racing up and down the hills with her two girlfriends from her childhood. Yeah. <laughs> I remember Maggie. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what was wrong with her? And can an animal's emotions lead them to sorrow or death? Oh boy, that's not really my area. But uh, personally, yeah, I, I think elephants should never be by themselves. You know, I, I actually did the, the biopsy that caused Annabelle to be euthanized. And that was a very sad thing because then Maggie just really went downhill from there. Um, and two elephants is not really very good either because they're such uh, social creatures. But I think a big problem for her is that she, could, she didn't have enough room to get enough um, um, exercise and the flooring was not great. So she was having some effects on her feet and her joints. Um, you know, so it's very, very happy story that she got to be moved. And I, I heard she was very happy down there. So I, you know, I do think that animals especially super social animals like that can have their health affected by not being in the proper, proper social setting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I uh, personally agree with that perspective just based on some things that I've seen as well. It's, it's, it's really tough for a social animal to be isolated. Yeah. I, on the other hand, I am not anti-zoo or aquarium. Um, I really see the benefit of the public being able to see animals in zoos and aquariums because it helps them to appreciate you know these creatures that are so amazing and uh, a lot of zoos and aquariums do amazing um, conservation kind of work like our beluga live capture projects at uh, the shed aquarium georgia aquarium i can't remember anywhere else i think those are the two mystic. main ones mystic too yes thank you thank you very much but, you know, a lot of them have a requirement to do, you know, wildlife conservation research. And then when you combine the wildlife information with captive animals where you've got them in hand and you can really do some studies, um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an amazing combination. Um, it just has to be done really well. Well, and a, an example of a success story was a few years ago, we had that baby beluga. Oh, that yes. That over near Tyone. So cute. Yeah. <laughs> And um, it was it was a huge team effort from all these other aquaria that came down to yeah. the Alaska Sea Life Center and really brought their knowledge and um, really helped bring the, the baby back to health. And unfortunately, because it was so young that a decision was made that it would probably not survive mm -hmm. if it was released. So it is now an ambassador of our Cook and the Beluga species. Um, yeah. And it's swimming around. It's got playmates, and um, it's got its own <laughs> pod now down at uh, I think it's uh, Sea World in Texas. Texas, yep. um, yeah, yeah. Would, so yeah. you know that that poor poor little guy, he probably wouldn't have been able to be saved if there wasn't a home for him to go to like that. Right. Yes. There's and this, value. And the Sea Life Center to to do the initial stabilization and be able to get them to be shipped to Texas. So I, I think there's, there's a lot of value to it, but again, it just, it has to be done, done well and has to be done in consideration of the social uh, factors of this particular species. So that's um, all the questions we've made it through. So it was good that you um, got through your talk. A, a, <laughs> Sorry about that. I just ripped interest. through. <laughs> no, it's perfect. This way we got um, a lot of individualized attention from you. Yeah, that was um, fun. So uh, again, thank you, Kathy. Thank you to everybody who um, joined us on the call. Um, again, if you wouldn't mind as you're leaving, just let me know where you're joining us from. Um, even if you're in Alaska, we've been able to reach more folks than normal. Um, than just to Anchorage. So we really appreciate that. And oh, we got someone from Homer. That's exciting. Oh, yay. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording now. And I will just leave the um, 
the site open to give folks some more time to put in their chat. And um, Kathy, thank you very much. And um, we'll hope to see you guys uh, next month. Stay tuned if you're interested in learning more about the Kenai rule, about how you can have your voice heard. Uh, stay tuned. Um, we're going to have a Wildlife Wednesday on that topic specifically. So thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Yep. Thank you.